Good afternoon, and welcome to the July 11th um, monthly budget committee meeting. Uh, we have a reasonable agenda this month, um, mostly year-end transfers. So we will start with um, ED11, uh, Board of Education, um, some year-end transfers, also referred to by the BOE as summer transfers. <laughs> and so we have Blaze Leviton, and we have a new visitor with us today. So Blaze, would you like to introduce? Yes, we also colleague? have uh, Kimberly Castoro with us, uh, who is helping run our finance team and has been with us for over a year, uh, since what, January 2022? Yeah. And plays a leading role in our financial management. Great. So I had the pleasure of meeting Kim back at the Habermeyer building, I guess, about a month ago. Mm -hmm. um, but it's nice to have you join our meeting today. So welcome. So, Blaze, what do we have to say today? Okay, so we, we only have one uh, general fund uh, summer transfer, as we'll call it. Um, and that is for the A6, uh, actually, this is for the A600 um, fund uh, and the 100s that we're balancing out. Um, that is the one negative overdraw. And that negative overdraw in that account specifically is in relation to a purchase order that we're encumbering funds to the town of Greenwich as part of our grant fund cleanup initiative. Um, and so we're holding funds aside um, from the general fund from this budget to repay essentially e-funds if needed. And so that's overdrawing that account uh, specifically. And so we're looking for a one-time summer transfer to balance out the A600-100s MLC. So that's a lot of inside real estate. So when we talked about a week ago, um, it was Ms. Moriarty, um, Mr. Geiger, and uh, you and, and me. I believe you, you talked about um, the education grant, special ed, uh, it's, Special education grant and um, the fact that the uh, employee benefits weren't included. Is this what we're talking about here? No. 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 This is the second one that we talked about, which is the e-funds. The, the that 70, been... 70. So can you just explain that a little bit for the public? Sure. So, yeah, it's one of the reasons that um, Kim's here with me. They're basically working together with town finance, kind of we're out of COVID, and we're going through and doing e-fund cleanup. And kind of starting around 2016, it looks like that e-funds, um, the grant funds stopped being, let's say, uh, religiously closed um, once they were balanced out. And e-funds are all the grant funds. So like IDEA, anything to do from a state or federal grant is an e-fund. Um, and so we, we went to go, we kept having um, payroll problems, essentially, where things keep getting charged to the wrong grant account codes. So the goal here is to just get those all deactivated in Munis. Uh, they shouldn't even be active. These grants don't exist anymore. It could be a grant from 2014, 2017. Uh, so we all met, though, Maureen, Roland, our team over at, at uh, Finance. Um, and as we started to dive into some of these historical accounts, we find that to close a grant account, we want, obviously, the revenue and the expenditures to balance equals zero. Um, and so when you close out a grant account, you if there's any excess funds, the state invoices us and we pay them back. Um, and so as we kind of go through maybe 70 or so funds, kind of Kim is going through making sure every single one of these balances. And then pre-2019, when the state launched their digital e-grant system, um, everything was done by paper. So we're literally going through like paper, well, not we, Kim's going through paper receipts um, and making sure that everything matches. In a bunch of these accounts, uh, there are f charges, you know, like basically it's all related to payroll because ADP will bypass anything in Munis, as we all know and kind of struggle with. 
And so if you take the sum of all these accounts, you know, we could be talking, we really have no idea, but it, it could be 100,000, it could be half a million, somewhere in there. So what we did was come together and figure that let's make sure that we would hold some funds from this fiscal year <coughs> off to the side. And as we go to balance out each e-fund to close it, if it turns out that it has a charge in it that is not an eligible charge to that e-fund account, we would pay it back. Um, really, it's an accounting mechanism. And we'll, we're still kind of working out how mechanically this will all work together. Um, but it, it takes a long time because there's two different things. Like the grant expired, but maybe the fund was left open in Munis. And then somehow anything that's open in Munis is also open in ADP. And we need to check it against the grant for that year. And then we also, uh, town finance brought up a good point, which is and then it's also checking the single audit for that year as well to see what was reported in expenditures because if we recorded an expense in 2022 in an e-fund that expired for a grant in 2016, you want to check every single one of those boxes was properly recorded before you close that fund. And so that's what we held spending back and made this encumbrance to the, to the general fund for. It was kind of a lot of information, but you know, hopefully that kind of makes sense. So the issues that you're beginning to address, and thank you for doing this, and thank you, Kim, for you know working on this together with yep. Maureen and, and, and Roland, Roland. And, yep. and the others in finance, um, they started, it sounds like they started pre-COVID. This isn't just a result of, of COVID? or I would say the funds are pre-COVID, and most of... There, there's definitely some pre-COVID, but probably the largest dollar amounts are during the time frame of COVID. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Questions? Leslie. Just to understand this better, because the amount you're transferring is a pretty specific amount, um, and and you talked about wanting a an amount to cover what's currently unknown, and it could be, you thought, maybe 100000 500000 You don't really know. So how, what is the 445646 and $0.61 going to This is to? just, the, the actual PO is 600000 the encumbrance. This is a summer transfer. It's just balancing out the 100s okay, to close by, the books. And by placing the, the encumbrance um, in the general fund, it would then allow you in, a f in the future, if necessary, to transfer money from the general fund to the grant fund. Is that what you're... How does the accounting work? Let's say you find um, that you owe the money state, you owe money to the state, you have an expense that was... There are two ways to owe the money to the state. One is we drew down revenue that was in excess of the amount of the expenses. The other is if there was an expense that wasn't appropriately charged to that particular grant. So let's say on an expense that wasn't appropriately charged, the accounting works. You would source money from, you would pay that money out of the general fund directly, or does it flow through the e-fund, or is this not a detail that's necessary to understand? Two things. One, the, the second part of your concern with the ineligible expense, that's not necessarily something we're worried about because they, the, each, for these historical years, they've all been audited already and had their audit done. Um, it's more just that it's an e-fund sitting open and, and a, it had a charge like from ADP in it that really should have been a general fund charge or should have been a different grant fund. So and it's more a transfer out of the e-fund accounting into the general fund, and so that's why the encumbrance so, is in the general fund. And I'll let, if Roland wants to answer, I don't think we know specifically what we just held the money aside off of this budget, and then we're coming up with the mechanics over the summer. So it, I guess if we owe the state money, if we got a, a grant for $500,000 and we only spent four fifty. We, that money is still sitting in the grant fund, so it's Correct. just a matter of taking that $50,000 and just giving it back to the state. Correct. It doesn't really cost the town anything other than maybe 
we should have spent it or something like that. But it that doesn't um, you don't need an encumbrance to return those funds. That's no. not what we're Correct? talking about. No. Right. So this okay. this is where we received five hundred thousand dollars and spent six hundred. That's where the issue we're trying to wrestle and, with. And what Blaze identified is that extra hundred thousand may just be an accounting error that ADP charged something that Board of Ed didn't approve to be charged to that. Most account. of them are accounting errors where in basically like at, in the Board of Ed payroll, it would be you had a $500,000 grant in 2019 and then that grant expires in 2020. And then in 2021, the grant's over with, it's done, gets audited, but it's not shut off in Munis. And then in 2021, that code somehow is pulled up in ADP and it, the charge hits the grant from 2019 in the e-fund, that fund's not even active, and it's not even a grant, it should be closed in Munis. But it's active in Munis. Right. It's not even on the grant list of the Board of Ed. It's just active e-fund, and it's hitting that way, which is why those would normally be closed. Those should be closed out so that that can't happen. We're talking, those are the kind of charges we're talking about. The new grant year started, but people weren't coded in the payroll system to that new grant. Correct. So that's, that seemed okay. to have happened a lot. Okay. That clears my questions up. Thank you. Nisha? Yeah. Um, so I think what, I think what you're, this was a helpful discussion. So I think what you're referring to is just the. I can't hear Nisha. I'm sorry. Is that better? Is it on? Yeah. Um, the account, the grant account just being overdrawn, underdrawn because of closing out and that stuff you guys are going to figure out and get organized. So going forward, that doesn't, you know, we can alleviate some of those concerns. Um, just looking at this particular transfer, the 445 coming from the transportation special and not having that background, what you just provided, my initial thought here was that we over budgeted for those two accounts and under budgeted for personnel. Therefore, we're moving from, you know, A to B. Um, so that, I'm not understanding how that, all of the uh, grant overage, underage mechanics, which I know you're going to correct and I know you're going to get on top of it, how is that relating to what we're talking about in terms of transfer? So every, obviously every MOC needs to balance to close the books and then the Board of Ed, the way that the budget is set up, it's not necessarily reflective of the actual budget. So 600 is, and 620, like really are not departments, like 620 is almost the whole entire Board of Ed, but we have to balance out each MOC in each department code. So A, 600, 100s, they have a negative overdraw on the 100s MOC, and even though the Board of Ed, even after this encumbrance is still returning 1.1 million, this is um, because we just put an encumbrance of $600,000 in one account in the 100s to hold the money aside. So it overdrew the 100s in 600 because it has the encumbrance in it. So it's, is it just accounting, kind of budgeting, kind of? Accounting, uh, budgeting. budgeting. We need to balance out the MOC within each department code. That's how the town does it. So it has to balance out. And then we just decided to hold money aside, surplus funds aside, intentionally for the purpose of balancing out the e-fund. Okay. Specifically, I mean, we, we could have, it could have been dozens of accounts that we moved in. We happen to have a significant savings. The reason we're, one of the reasons that we're returning funds, um, there's a significant savings in transportation. So if you recall, um, our transportation director, Elmer, um, Dr. Carabillo, and Eugene, our purchase, Eugene Watts, the purchasing director, they've been extremely aggressive with the busing company. Um, those savings were originally about 1.2 million. That was used partially to balance out a significant portion of the operating budget during the year. And then that ended up being, this is the result of penalties, the transition of the company. Uh, those savings ended up being closer to like $2 million. And so 1 million of that was basically just in penalties. And the bulk of that came from, if you recall, the poor performance of the bus company in September with all those problems. Um, that was nearly a 
uh, that one penalty alone for just that month was like over three quarters of a million that we penalized the bus company for. And then there was the, a couple bumpy roads in October, November, and then um, they just didn't invoice us for like the fall for field trips. I don't know, but okay. <laughs> they didn't get them in in time. So okay. that's where that savings is coming from. And then the other one's just the special ed settlement account, 700s. Okay. Could have been a sum of all kinds of accounts that we picked it from. Those just happen to have big pockets of money in them because of those specific reasons. Thanks, Liz. Laura? Are you, are you, I'm sorry? You're finished, right? Did you? Oh, I'm yeah. No, Laura? So I'm trying to wrap my head around this, and, and maybe I'm just, I didn't have my Wheaties this morning for accounting discussions. But so just quite simply, so you have employees who are funded by grants, uh, both salary and benefits. So ADP charged a uh, basically an expired grant fund. But that employee is probably the same employee just put in a new grant fund, right? Most likely? Yes. Yeah. So what I'm trying to figure out is why isn't it just an accounting on the ledger as opposed to you need to actually take cash, if I'm looking at this properly, to encumber when at the end of the day you're just going to be balancing out accounts, the debits and the credits are going to wash in theory. You go ahead. Well, because it, it may be that we charged more expenses to the grants than they had revenue available to them. So if the grant was for 500 and we spent 600. It, it's not even at, that, at though. It's that, the, that. It's that the charge occurred after the grant was closed. But I know, but then it went to a different grant in some cases. Right. So it has a. A cumulative effect. Cumulative effect, it, yeah. It, it could have been that we either had the, that dollar amount. At, at the end of the day, it's that that grant fund shouldn't have been charged. But it's open in Munis. It happens through ADP. And it could be a $2,000 stipend payment. It could be some, you know, some other type of payment. The sum of all these payments hit these grant accounts. The, each fiscal year is closed. So the E-fund either has to balance out we're, we're talking charges that would not, since some of this goes so far back to your, to your question, right? So if this e-fund account was set up in 2017, mm -hmm. and, and you'll know this better than I, so you can explain it if I do this wrong. The e-fund was set up in 2017. The grant expires in 2018. A charge hits it in 2020. Also, though, that grant is also expired by now. It's 2023. So we can't move that to a grant expense because the grant would say, well, that happened in 2021. So th it really has to just be balanced off the general fund because there's no other. It's not like you can just charge 2020 expenses to the 2023 grants. Okay. So I don't want to get too deep in the weeds on this, but yeah. just two quick questions. Is, I mean, because there wasn't much backup on this, and yeah. so I'm kind of coming up to speed. Um, is there going to be a report or a reconciliation or something that could be made available to us at a future point so we can more fully wrap our heads around this? And secondly, is this just an accounting issue or is there a control slash policy issue? Are we, are we not closing out our grants in the right way? Do we need a new policy procedure? Are we, is the grant not covering what we think it's going to be covering so we're exceeding our allocation from the grant. I'm just trying to wrap my head around. It, it sounds a little deeper than just an accounting, but I'm not sure. Yeah, there's two things here. The transfer is really just balancing out the, the Board of Ed budget. It happens to just be I'm also giving the explanation behind this one specific account um, because I thought it was valuable information to bring you know forward. Uh, it's very premature. Um, right now. So we're still kind of all working together to figure out exactly the mechanics of what we're going to do. This is mostly an accounting problem. This wasn't happening before. It became an accounting problem. It's the two systems not working well with one another. It's ADP and Munis. And so we need to just get all of these closed, get them out of Munis, get them out of ADP and get back to how it used to be when there's really only six or seven accounts that even exist and not 70-something accounts that exist inside the payroll system. So, 
So I have another question. That makes sense. When we, when we met, we also talked about the um, special ed grant, and um, I guess we'll call it, you know, overspending to the extent that um, the benefits weren't calculated within the grant. And it was my understanding that perhaps that was to the tune of about a half a million dollars. So I expected some paperwork for that, which is why I wanted to know if that was included here, but you have said no. So can you just explain, give us a little bit more on that one also? Because, you know, it's a pretty sizable amount and something just to forget. And then, you know, I agree with Laura, you know, how are we going to um, address either through policies or procedures um, so that this doesn't happen again? Yeah, good good question. So, and I, I I don't oversee payroll at the Board of Ed, so I'll just leave it at that. I'm but sorry? I don't oversee payroll at the Board of Ed, so I will leave it at that. But... Um, uh, well, then, you know, that's not... I mean, we need to communicate. Someone needs to communicate yes. with whoever oversees payroll at yes. the Board of Ed. And who is that person? That's Dr. Bud. Thank you. Um, so, but what you're... So the reason it's not here, because we're just, this is just a summer transfer. And so that expense is already balanced within the budget. This is the only uh, transfer that's crossing MOCs and department codes. So this is the only summer transfer. Um, the IDEA grant 2023, 2023 um, was short on benefits. So what that means is that the grant was has this is our largest grant. This is the special ed grant. Um, it has like 27 staff on it. The uh, grant usually also carries its own benefits. In the fall, the grant the district was cited by the federal government for disproportionate identification of students um, as special needs. And that came with a 15% requirement to set aside the grant of that fiscal year. Um, that set aside, 15% of the grant, would was now isolating that those funds could not be used for other activities described in the grant. They could only be used at reducing the racial, di racial disparity in identification of special ed students. Um, what the, to make up the, I mean, obviously we need every, uh, the IDA grant is providing required services. Um, so it puts it in a tough place. The grant manager at the time, uh, this is last summer, balanced that out by removing the benefits from the grant. The grant, when we found this out, and went to go pay benefits, the town charges each grant fund benefits. When we went to go pay, it could only pay uh, like $70,000 out of the half a million in grant expense. We calculate the grant expense based on Roland's schedule formula uh, of salary. And we made an intentional uh, decision, this is when we were going to unfreeze, um, to hold back the remaining, it was about 444000 and we charged it to the special education program operating budget, the Board of Ed's budget, to pay the 900, we did a journal voucher to pay the 900 account, the owed expense. And that's done out of the operating budget. There's no summer transfer because the books still balance without crossing MLCs, so there's not a summer transfer, but for informational purposes, too, when we met with the chair and the vice chair, the, the budget committee wanted to let you know, too, that that had happened. So, you know, we appreciate that. And Roland has been working with you all on this to make sure. Very closely. It's, you know, working, correct, Roland? And He's so, a man. <laughs> and, but most importantly, what is going to be done to make sure that this doesn't happen again? So the grant manager, this is uh, Dr. H, um, and she is working, actually she's working with Kim too, 
um, working on the 24 grant. Um, the federal government actually didn't provide a COLA this year, but it may come at a later time. And so the grant's already balanced, and she's working on ensuring that the 24 allocation will also cover the staff that are on the grant. At the end of the day, we have to, they're providing required special education services, so it puts us in a tough spot to set aside, but my understanding is, is that for 24, the goal is to ensure that the staff on the grant are covered by the grant, and they're and reworking some of the grant so program now. And so you're following up on this? We are, very closely. <laughs> and Roland, and you're staying in touch with Roland to make sure that benefits will be paid, correct? But, I mean... Between Too the town often. and, and, and Too the Too often, probably, yeah. Okay, okay. Can I ask one further question? Do you have an extra 39 cents in uh, 52120 to round out your budget request? <laughs> I think uh, this is right down to the penny, and <laughs> we will likely submit some of these transfers to the nearest thousand in the future. Okay, but if I make a motion to round it to the nearest dollar, you would be... Okay, with 39 cents extra coming out of that account. If you're not, you're not, but <laughs> he, looks a little, he looks a little too stressed. To, to but then he may be short in the other account. Can I go down by 61 cents? You can't go down, I can okay. tell you that. Okay. That's to the penny. All right, I, I, will I, I, I think, you do know, it to the penny. I think we should do it to the penny. Right. But, you know, I, in the I future. just look at, at Blaze being too stressed. <laughs> All right, can I make a motion uh, to approve the... Board of Ed transfer um, of $445,646.61 into uh, 51990. And I'll second. And just for edification, uh, this approval does not need to go to the full BT. It's the authorities delegated to our, our committee. Thank you, Leslie, for adding that. Um, and so those in favor of... Ms. Moriarty's motion, seconded by Ms. Aurora. Okay. Um, those opposed? Those abstaining? And that motion has passed, 301. So thank you very much, Blaze and Kim. And we hope you enjoy your summer. Am I staying oh, here for oh, school lunch? Oh, fun? you're doing school. <laughs> you just, no, no, no. I'll go. Well, I'll well go. the other one is school lunch. I sometimes I never know whether who's going to do that. Sometimes Roland does things like this. Rolling, okay, Rolling school lunch. Do. School lunch. Uh, school lunch fund. It's just to say this is so. These are the summer transfers. We're balancing out the one hundreds um, with it with. Accounts from we're, we're crossing major object codes. It requires board of estimate and taxation approval. Um, I did forget to mention, Leslie. You just reminded me that uh, the board of ed budget committee per or that same MOU, the board of ed um, budget committee voted on these yesterday uh, unanimously on both of these. So I should have mentioned that for process. Um, so here it's just balanced. There was an overdraw on the 100s in the 670 budget by 131,000, and it's using funds elsewhere to balance that out. So I did listen in to your meeting yesterday, although I must you know? say I lost a little cell service at one point in time, but it worked. Um, but And it talked about overtime, which it does say up here. But I noticed that your justification down below says to cover temporary salary shortfalls rather than overtime. Oh, oops. Oh, it, it, it kind of, Blaze is looking at, oh, at Roland like maybe Roland prepared this rather than Blaze? Well, maybe, but <laughs> uh, it's, it's okay, overtime. I, I, it's, I, over, it's I, the 100s and it's overtime. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, but that's what I heard on your um, meeting yesterday that it was overtime. Yeah. Did anyone questions? I just, I, I just have to ask one question. So just general broad strokes, the overtime, just vacancies, What's what was the driver of the overtime? A lot of, uh, yeah, we had a lot of staff staffing uh, issues uh, with the school lunch fund. Uh, so there's two things. Yeah, it was a lot of vacancies, a lot of sick, high uh, call out, so having people on overtime. Um, 
and then there's still some residual effects from the fluctuation. That's the primary reason. And then there's still some residual effects from the uh, historically very high participation rate uh, due to the universal free lunch during the school year, too. So remember, we've gone from pre-COVID, like 30-something percent participation, like 33, to during COVID, even throughout this year, we were between like 88 and 92 throughout the year. Okay, so, so you needed more staff in addition to the totally, typical call totally different to meet the program. Demand. Okay, yeah. thank you. And we're bringing in, I should say, and th part of this is is probably was my misunderstanding of some things about the school lunch fund, but the uh, we're still bringing in significant because of the universal uh, free lunch and then the high volume that came with that and the federal, the additional federal funding that came with the high, because we get cash in lieu of commodity, for example, we're bringing in significantly uh, more revenue over budget uh, in the school lunch fund. So the, the school lunch fund is still ending positive, but we're balancing out the expense MOCs here. So that's what's happening here. But... If you think like this year we budgeted, I think 100, this 23, we budgeted 150,000 for clock cash and low commodity, which is based on volume in the rear of the previous year. And it, it's bringing in more like 700,000 because it's based on the, the volume of the previous year. Any other questions? The only question I have, and this is, I'm looking at our BET reference guide, but this is the school lunch fund. It's a separate grant fund. Does this fall within the budget committee's authority to approve the transfer? Does this need to go to the full BET? I, I think this one needs to go to the full BET, but I looked at Pete and Roland. I think it, this needs to go to the full BET. So can I make a motion? Should... I'll make the motion uh, to approve the transfer of 131000 for the school lunch fund, and I recommend it be routine. I'll second. Motion made by Ms. Moriarty, seconded by Ms. Aurora. All uh, those in favor? Uh, okay, so that motion. 400. Zero. Four zero zero, just going to announce it. That motion passes 400. Zero zero. Thank you. There Thank are, you. I'll be sending, we're going to send out some communications to, to the budget committee. Uh, this is not on the agenda. So, based on some state legislation that was passed just in this session, especially for special education. Um, there's a number of unfunded mandates that were put into effect immediately for this school year. And so we're putting together kind of an estimate and a document of that. And it's not necessarily that there's any action or anything required, but it's just something that should be, we should all be aware of. The one for special education, uh, for example, the age, um, Students like until law was the law was just changed. Students phase out at age 22 on their birthday. Um, the state effective immediately. Um, it was signed by the governor. Extended that to the school year in which they turn 20 to the, that they turn 22. So if someone was aging out, like in Stacy's model, if someone was aging out in September, um, they turn 22, and she had budgeted for them. Uh, basically to, to leave, this is also for out-of-district placement, um, they are now eligible for a whole nother school year. It's the same thing if someone was going to leave in December, they would have aged out in December. They're now eligible also till June 30th. Um, and so that, that was just passed. We're going to share, share some more information on that through email, but that's context for the email that's coming. Thank just, you very much. Thank you, thank everybody. You Have a good summer. So our next um, application is from the health department, and it's HD1 for $36,368, and it's a previous uh, approval to use a PHEP grant. So we welcome the health department team. No, the green means it's on. Thank you for having us. My name is Matthew Enginito. I'm the business office manager for the health department, and I'm accompanied by Deb Edwards. 
um, the director's uh, administrator. And uh, I'd like to uh, first thank you for having us. And um, I'd like to get started. Um, as we see here, we're just simply having a request uh, which is being made to accept the federal funding from the state um, for the fiduciary for a part-time position funded by the PHEP grant, which has, has been enacted for several years uh, running now. Uh, this, this, um, this area is to support emergency preparedness coordination. Um, it will handle the salary for the employee by the name of David Frasca, his social security benefits and mileage, really to conduct business um, on a part-time basis for the health department. Uh, the salaries in included for David is $33,412, which is under temporary salary for the grant code of 403824, followed by his social security benefits allocated for $2,556, and a sm uh, rather uh, small mileage allowance for uh, conducting business for meetings and, and other um, planning and response activities associated with the role. Uh, his mileage allowance is set at $400. And we are just requesting approval from the Board of Estimation and Taxation for, for such business. Thank you for your explanation. Thank you. Leslie. My only question um, typically I believe this comes to us in the fall um, as opposed to July so I know that you come to us as soon as you get notification but did anything change to impact that calendar yeah yeah I came early this year um, they have new people taking care of the PHEP grant up in the state um, and they're actually changing a few grants this year, like Public Act. They're having new ways they're going to be doing things. So this is now on time. They're going to be trying to get it on time, but we'll see how it goes. But yes, this we were supposed to get it earlier years, but they were never. Thank you. That's great. So this person would start... When would, when would this person be active under this grant? At this point, we always have Dave Frasca. Usually we um, roll him over into our 401 for a little bit. And then when the PHEP uh, would come through, then we would do a PIF to put him into the PHEP. So if this goes through, we put him right, I think, right into the PHEP. Thank you. Nisha, do you have any questions? Um, I think you answered my question. I was just going to ask, is this employee already, uh, is this part-time employee already employed with the town? And this is just, this yeah. grant is just covering his part-time. Yeah, he's been with the town for a couple of years now. Okay. And then um, you also mentioned um, in your opening remarks that this grant's been going on for a few years. years. <laughs> How long? Years and years. Way before me, and I started in 2017, and I know it's was like 10 years before then, so. So this is, this grant is gonna be foreseeably in the future, we we don't see this going away anytime soon. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. Motion? So I'll make a motion to approve the use of the PHEP grant of $36,368 and to make this routine. I'll okay. second. Okay, so motion made by Ms. Moriarty, um, seconded by Ms. Aurora. Those in favor for a routine and those. So that motion has passed, 400. Zero, zero. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Enjoy your summer. You as well. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have Nathaniel Witherall. I don't know if John, you want to come up and sit at the table? I don't know. Maybe Roland is going to talk. Maybe you're going to talk. I'm not sure. But we have our executive director of Nathaniel Witherall here, so it's nice to recognize him and invite him up here. So um, thank you. So Roland, I believe you were going to talk to this, to this, and also in addition, I think um, 
you very kindly put together an additional exhibit, which I asked for to understand where we are in terms of spending the, the money. And so this is to cover a shortfall at Nathaniel Witherall. And what we need is another $100,000 because Nathaniel Witherall came in May, 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 and it didn't prove out to be sufficient. So would you like to tell us well, what's going on? We were going? estimating in May, we were still trying to get a better handle on the expenses that we saw coming, particularly the professional fees. And uh, when we got to the end of the year and we started to encumber what we didn't have invoices for, uh, we needed another $100,000. Uh, and that, that's pretty much it. Like I said, it was two months ago that we made that first estimate, and as we got closer, now we just need some more. So, um, so the first comment I'll make here is we congratulate you on, on hiring um, Joan Lynch, our assistant treasurer in finance. We think you're very fortunate, Nathaniel Weatherall, to um, have uh, Joan join your um, department. And quite frankly, I'll speak for myself. I'm very sad in finance to lose her, but we know she's still with the town, and we think this is really great because we also know it will help Roland. We, we agree. <laughs> so, Laura, you had a more to the point question. No, I think that's important. That's good news. Um, so my only question is, so this sheet is the same sheet that we saw in May. So it, is it, there an update? Do you have any... It is, we, we just, uh, in addition to these larger encumbrance, uh, there were other things that were encumbered as well along the way, some smaller items that just kind of accumulated, not just here, but also in, uh, in maintenance. We didn't run over the budget in maintenance, but uh, it was just a lot of cleanup as we got toward year end. Any other questions? Just... Just to identify the sort of question that hasn't been asked, and I don't know if we need to go into it, but clearly um, some of these unbudgeted consultant expenses are continuing on into fiscal 24, and I'm sure it puts pressure already on the fiscal 24 budget. And so while we are taking action on fiscal 23, there's an awareness that uh, the, the shortfalls in the Budgeted amounts we have for Nathaniel Witherell are uh, clearly in question for 24. So that's a good question. So um, I'm not sure. I'll turn to Roland again. Um, how do you, you know, I'll, I'll talk about the unbudgeted items because they continue to be unbudgeted. Where do you see this going, Roland? Um, you know, basically for, I'll call the real financial part of it, maybe. Um, the numbers here are just, you know, I guess it's around $917,000, $917,000, and then for the legal part of it, about another 85000 So now that for a total of a million two, which is rather dismaying. Um, that's my own comment at the end. Um, where do you see this going, Roland? Well, we know that I mean, we know you're not in charge, but, you know, you, you seem to have a good handle on this. Well, well, we know that some of the consulting will continue in terms of uh, the, the biller that's going to go on for the CBO future. That was not budgeted. And also the conversion to the, uh, the new uh, system, moving away from matrix to point and click, uh, that conversion will also require some, some additional consulting money. And is that underway now, or will will it be the conversion I, to the uh, point click care uh, is still on point to to uh, launch on eight one. Thank you. And and I think too, just to add to what Roland said, um, and pursuant to to uh, Joan coming on board is. Most likely, I foresee, uh, and I've spoken with, with the board as well about this, that um, we, would, we would want to help supplement her skill set, um, probably with uh, Grassi 
or, or uh, probably with Garasi, uh, just to, to get Joan up to speed with um, long-term health care uh, billing, Medicare, Medicaid, managed care, et cetera. So I, 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 don't, I don't have a hard, fast number on that yet, but I will, along with the board, put something together uh, for the BET. Okay, that, that sounds great. Um, I, I also have a, um, a related question, I guess. Um, we have this money, Roland, this extra 100000 is coming from benefits. And then if we, you know, look at what came from benefits last month. So the question is, um, so it looks to me like benefits, according to this accounting summary, were over budgeted by $518,000. So question for you, as we move ahead into fiscal 24, did we also over budget benefits you know, by an approximate the, same amount? Well, in 23, the bulk of the benefit savings came from the fact that there were a lot of vacancies uh, throughout, throughout the entire year. I mean, there was 10 to 15 vacancies a month. So if you think of what the benefits are for 10, 15 people, you're getting close to that $500,000. And you can see that in, in the overtime that was uh, used to backfill most of these positions. But I was surprised, using your example, that you know if we add, in Leslie's example, a six hundred and three dollar addition to their salary account, um, it would have been five hundred thousand, and the benefits were about five eighteen. So very close in a one to one relationship. Um, you know, I was surprised that. The benefit package right, would be very. I'm sorry, just looking at your sheet here. The saving. Those those are those aren't person. Those aren't uh, employees. Those are outside contractors. No, I'm talking oh. about. Um, I'm talking about where the money. I guess the money is coming from. The money is coming from salary savings. Um, be, um, benefits, and the relation is almost one to one in terms of, of salaries which is, you know, what you're talking about, not all the positions filled, and benefits. I would, have, I would not have expected that relationship to be basically a one-to-one. -one. Well, Something I, to think about. We need to look at our budget as we look at our budget for next year, and we can begin to look at guidelines coming very soon. I'm kind of confused now. Can I just now ask a clarifying question? Now we've wandered off topic, but it is so, an off topic is how we're funding the. Um, well, I just want to be clear. So when we have vacancies in our budget, we budget for the salaries and benefits, assuming those vacancies are going to be filled. And are you saying that we're over budgeting because you think the bud benefits are budgeted at 100 percent of salary? I'm just well, trying to figure I out mean, what we're saying. I, I'm saying that the savings for salaries and the savings for benefits were approximately one-to-one -one relationship. Pretty clear, you know, close. Very, it's almost one-to-one. -one. I would have expected that the benefits would have been maybe half, two-thirds of the salary savings, you know? I mean, rather than a one-to-one -one, um, cash compensation to benefit. That's my only point here. And I guess my, I don't know if I, I hesitate to draw that conclusion from this chart, but... I guess we'll look at that. Yeah. And no, I mean, it's, it's just something to think about. That's what I said. I mean, you know, it's not a definitive, but that's how this is going to be funded. Um, and then I have one other point, which really is off the mark. So do you want to wait and get this approved? So I just want to make sure, John, that um, we have this understanding that in our TOO budget for Witherall, it's flat with last year. Um, that there were, I think, believe there were three positions added for a short period of time, and then that was going to be through June 30th, and then it was going to return to the TOO budget for fiscal year 24. So I just wanted to see Roland working on his, um, but just a little reminder, and we appreciate your acknowledgement of that. Duly noted. Thank you. Okay, do we have any, um, can, 
Uh, yes. Can I make well, one statement first, just um, regarding that statement? You realize, and, and it came out when we talked about this, I wonder whether they even hired those three people because they said that they couldn't they couldn't eliminate three positions for the food service workers, so they would continue to pay the 35% extra expense because they didn't have those spots to give up. I don't know what actually happened. I don't know whether three food servicers workers were actually hired or whether we're still contracting for that, but um, I, I didn't want you to leave with the assumption that they corrected the financial problem even though you put this handcuff on them for the operational It wasn't concerns. me. We all did during our budget process, and we said that it would be The majority flat, of the BET did, yeah. Flat headcount um, year over year, and um, there was a temporary increase, and that was to... I mean, we're very close to the beginning of the fiscal year, so it's just a good reminder mm -hmm. because we all forget about so many things that we do. There's so many things. Okay. Do I? Are there any motions? Um, Harry did have. A oh, I'm sorry, Harry. I didn't. I, you, I, you'd raise, and then we got That's a little. Quite all right. Um, a question for John. Um, your your attachment references two firms, Cyan and CP Corridor. But the Grassy report that was sent to me last night by Nisha Hurst refers to Comprehensive Healthcare Solutions as the one doing the AR collections. So what what is Cyan and what is CP Corridor? And CP Corridor is uh, Corridor bought uh, Comprehensive, and and so now, for want of a better term, they've they've merged. Uh, companies, um, and the parent company is Corridor. I don't think they've let any, uh, they, uh, they haven't made any changes to personnel, but, but uh, Comprehensive is now CP Corridor. Okay. And so I, I, I believe uh, that Cyan, I think, I would have to uh, verify that, but I think, go ahead. Okay. Pete. Cyan is Anna Bellisiano. It's uh, ah, right. Okay. They, she was hired for five days last August. We finance alerted uh, Nathaniel Witherall. They stopped it. She was ultimately paid in total one hundred sixty-three thousand. Okay, so they're not doing anything anymore. No. CP Corridor, other no, otherwise known as Comprehensive, is the only firm working on it. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So I'll make I'll make the motion yeah. to approve. Um, a transfer to Nathaniel Witherell of $100,000. And are second. you doing that as routine uh, as or re non-routine? As routine. And I'll second. So, motion made by Ms. Moriarty, seconded by Ms. Wara um, for routine transaction. Those in favor? So that motion passes for zero, zero. So have a great summer, John. Thank you. Thank you very much. So is summer busy time in your business? Is summer busy? Yes. And do you still have those cookouts on the <laughs> terrace? Uh, when, when we have the, the funds, we do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so enjoy. So enjoy. Um, okay. Um, so the next we have our... Um, economic conditions report, and Roland, I think we're in the process of doing year-end. Closing right now, we'll have something next week. Okay, so, um, you know, again, it's a timing issue. Um, I will just make a comment here because we had a very early meeting last month, I think it was on June 6th, and the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics doesn't issue their information for June until tomorrow. So, the, But last month, the Consumer Price Index for our area um, for the month of May um, was um, up 0.2% over the month, and it was up 3.5% over the year. And I just note that, um, you know, the annual... Um, we saw it move progressively down um, every month from this January of this year when it was 6%. Now it's 35 
as of May, and that also um, that it's really been falling since last June, June of 2022, when it was at 6.7%. So I just make the comment, the only thing that we have in terms of economic report, but we also have a new report with our economic report, right? And it's called capital closeouts. Are we going to talk about that a little bit, Roland? This is a new report, and it was requested and agreed um, at various meetings that um, we should get regular reporting on capital project account closures, and the program is going to go on every month that we hold the meeting. So like, it won't go in August, so in September we'll have two months, right. but for every month thereafter it will be monthly with the economic package. But because this is the first time that we have done such a report, um, which was put together by Adam, um, this was shows the whole fiscal year. Is that correct, Summer? And the question is, have we learned something and what are we learning? So I will ask anyone, have they learned something? Do they want to make any comments? Well, the only one is we only got this midday yesterday, and so we haven't had a well, lot even, of time to work even, with even it. Even then, we struggled to get it into the package, to be honest with you. I would probably request that instead of ordering this by the budget size, to order it by... Um, I think that I have to think about it. It may make sense to order it by project number or by department, um, but I'm not sure the value of the budget really helps me understand. For example, if I'm looking at highway streets and bridges to understand if they used up all of the old money and have new money, I, it's harder for me to pick that out. Um, and again, these are initial um, comments. I have to think some of these through. The second thing that I didn't understand for example, for highway streets and bridges, um, there, well, we typically see it as one large project. I, well, let me go to this, like the sewer division, which doesn't even have original budget. So can you tell us a little bit more how we see this data? Is this, this is all, if I go back to an old CIP sheet, um, and maybe we stick with DPW first, but if I go back to an old CIP sheet, each one of these are an independent project that the board of the BET has voted on, or are some of these parsed out? I guess I don't, maybe it should be by project number, I don't the know. The board of ed ones are parsed out, but I, I, I see what you mean. And so we'll put the original budget in, so you can see that the highway was a million dollars or whatever it happened to be at that time, and what was spent. Yeah, so like, for example, the Board of Education is about two-thirds down on the first page, renovate gymnasium. There are two in a row. They're closed out. Each one was $2,601. I'm sure we approved, we either approved 5200 or we approved a large amount because there are other gymnasiums that are not yet closed out. Um, and so each one of these line items would refer to an individual location, I guess, that yes. sits in Munis, and we don't see that detail. Um, so, it, so you know, some of these I'd struggle a little bit of how to utilize the data. Um, I asked you also, and maybe this is something we should consider, um, an open capital report. I don't know if there's information that we'd find valuable to look at what's open at the same time as looking what's closed, that the two reports should be published monthly, simultaneously, and then we're all looking at the same data. I, maybe we don't put that in the packet. I don't know. I'm just... Again, I mean, I think, yeah, here. I think that I think that gets quite complicated. Um, I know Laura has her hand up too, and I don't know how many. I have other, some other questions and comments too. Yeah, I'll stop there and let other people speak. Laura. Well, I actually <clears throat> don't know quite what to make of this report, and um, you know, if we're going to generate reports on a monthly basis, we need to have a purpose and a goal, and how we're going to use the information. I mean, to me, this is sort of the open capital report presented differently. We've closed out X number of capital projects. Our open capital has gone down. So I'm not quite sure 
I'm actually not quite sure if we need this report, um, but I will, you know, let's talk about it. I mean, well, what, I, what's the value in, in doing this? So um, we can answer that question after we ask a couple more questions, okay? Because um, I don't, you know, again. Um, so Roland, um, along with what Leslie said, I'm wondering if projects are closing out, do we really care? And I know we do in some ways, but we could just have a column to say this. It, you know, Leslie talked about putting them together by the project number. And I'm wondering if there should be any differentiation between the bond fund and the Z fund, or rather, because it looks like sometimes they're just little pieces have gone one place or not another. So I'm wondering if we are going to make it more useful if we should be merging um, those two, this is a question, those two funds. And so that's something else to think about in terms of, of that. I mean, you can still have the, yeah, no. you know, the, the source of funding there, but does that make a difference or is it better to have it all together so we have a better feel? The only for thing, you know, one takeaway in looking at the report is that we know that $3.8 is going back into the capital fund. So identifying how much are coming, our Z fund projects, um, does go back into funding other capital projects. The bond fund is just the authorization goes away. So that's an interesting piece of information to be able to get. Um, then there were things I was confused about. Um, I, I couldn't understand why, like transfers in, let's just pick one, windows and doors, Board of Education. Transfers in of 161,000 and you've already got 5,000 there. And then it's close at 160, 165, which is the total of the two. Why would they be transferred in and then close? I don't know that one. We don't know. Um, and then there were, the, you know, as an example, I was also a little confused that, say, money from including GHS soil remediation would be closed out because I thought we were using up every single penny of what they have there under contracts. And that's down under the bond fund. Um, and it's BOE projects done by DPW. So, you know, it does make you look at some of these things. I was surprised that, say, vertical transportation of $37,000, which I assume was maybe the design money, basically almost the whole thing is being returned. Um, so I, I do think, you know, or steps for Old Greenwich was in the budget and then they were not, nothing was done and they returned that. So it becomes kind of interesting. But then when you go to the Z fund and the Ham Hamilton Avenue buildings down there, and it's, this is from 2015, it just looks like money is being transferred. I, I wasn't sure what was happening because it didn't add up. <laughs> One look was positive, one was negative, and then all of a sudden it was like closing out at 109, 689. So I think it's an interesting report. Um, but I think this is a first, first read. And Nisha, do you have any comments? Yeah, no, I had a hard time reading this report um, simply because I was expecting... I think the takeaway, um, as Leslie Moriarty pointed out correctly, is the three, you know, the three point eight, for example, you know, going back from the Z fund. But I think what would have been helpful um, is one, the numbers need to add up. So column A plus column B needs to equal column C, meaning original budget plus minus the transfers need to equal the revised. If it doesn't, we need to understand why. Um, perhaps the original budget has been revised, and you know, it's not being reflected in this. Um, the second, in terms of how we, what would make sense in actually being able to do something with this information, it should be organized by department. And then within that department, you could sort it large to small, you know, highest to small, just so we can get a sense. I, I, and I know we can work yeah, on it. I think we can make it look more like the Oakland Capital Report. I think that would make some more sense. I mean, we can play around with it, but I think in order for us to be yeah. able to actually do something with this information, um, and then I would want to see 
total sums, right, in original budget and rev revised. So I was trying to, you know, add it up myself. It was a PDF. Um, you know, what was the original budget? What did we actually spend? And what ended up getting returned? Um, and, you know... But, but that really... Is how, like, or however, right? Like column, I wanted to see a sum at the bottom of each one the same way. That total, like that bold total box, I wanted to see that um, across. And of course, if you change the categories, you know, it'll be reflected um, differently and it might make sense. I mean, these numbers are very materially, some of these are very small, um, but for some of the larger ones, I'd want to understand, you know, just put the percent there so we know 10% got returned back, 70, whatever. That number might be. Now, some of these, like, I mean, eighty percent of this is like things under fifty grand. So I just like I, not I, relevant. I to, but I just like to point out this is for a whole year, twelve months. So, you know, if we are doing it more frequently, which was suggested, but this was a way to begin the program, which is a good way to look at the whole thing. Um, this is this is twelve for the full fiscal year. Right. I mean, to me, the important thing is there's a process that the departments are doing to close out old capital projects. I mean, I look at the 3.8 and, you know, 2.8 of that is the Greenwich Ave bump out. So a million dollars over a full year for all these various project codes, that's not a surprising number to me. Right. So nothing, there's no outliers here that I can tell. So, you know, I don't know how, how difficult it is to generate this report. Only the finance department can say if this is a good use of our human capital. Um, when we may have other reports that can give us similar information. So I think if we're going to do something like this, we have to understand what's the goal, what are we trying to, you know, what are we lacking that we don't have in current reports, and then what are we going to do with the information? So, again, happy to have this discussion, you know. Yeah, sounds like, I mean. So we can do it again in September and then reevaluate. But if this is a whole year, I can't imagine there's going to be much in September. No, I, I mean, well, they do a lot of work in the summertime. So maybe... September or October is going to have more activity than it might in January, but I agree with you. Maybe it's I mean, a quarterly versus a monthly. Well, I suggested that, but, you know, it seemed to be more than monthly, but I think that that's a, you know, we can just see what happens. Leslie, do you have any further comments now that you've heard some of our comments? Yeah, I just want to reinforce, I think Laura raised a good point, how we're going to use this data. I'd hate for this as a board to focus on $92 for the police and there's Intercepted. Now we have a tendency to, to to ask a lot of questions about anything placed before us. So I think it's good to just think about what information um, we we did this to help us. I think improve our capital planning process to know, you know, are we a, what we're approving is being spent on what we expected it to, and how good are the estimates? And this should help us inform that. Also to inform um, what funds uh, we have available for capital uh, projects. And so the return funds is, is an important number. But I do think it's very easy to get a report, jump in and analyze the data and, and the way it's presented, as I did, and I started off the discussion, but then to step back and think about what's useful information and, and how best to get it. So I think the finance department is responding to a question that this board's asked about closeouts of partial projects. So this is a great first um, iteration. It gives us something to really think about what we need and how we need how we want to get it. And and also I think Roland can go back and he can talk to Adam. You know, listen to us and you know perhaps they can talk together and um, have some ideas. Yeah. You know, based on what's been said. Can I just add one comment? Um, yeah, so I think, you know, I think the discussion is good. I don't know who requested this report <laughs> on this board, um, but, uh, you know, I, sometimes you don't know what you need until you see it, right? right. So um, I didn't request it. I didn't request this report, um, but whoever did, I think it's a good idea because now that I see it, I see there's valuable information in it. Um, but I do think, you know, to Leslie Moriarty's point, we don't want to get lost in the immateriality so we can – you know, either say we only want to see over a greater number, we can ourselves just ignore things below a certain number. That's what I do when I see reports like this. Um, but I don't think it's fair to say, well, you know, we don't, you know, we shouldn't be doing something like this because it might not. You know, sometimes you don't know what what you what information could be pulled out or what could help us make decisions. Um, I liked this report. I don't think I need to see it more than once a year, even maybe twice a year. Um, but 
it's just good every now and then to check in. And well, I have suggested quarterly, but I think That's that we too. were, yeah. you know, yeah. and I think Laura's just talking about that too, but, yeah. you know, I'm happy to go with the flow. I mean, if we wanted to say that, Leslie, do you think you would like to see the report in September, or should we say that the next time we should see the report should be in October, which would be for the first quarter of the fiscal year? In October meeting. Or would you rather have it monthly so we'll start in September? I, I think there's some work, you know, one that Roland and Pete and are listening to what our conversations are, but we're asking a lot of questions. We're not providing a whole lot of direction at the moment, right? So um, so we can move to quarterly, but I think if the members of this board thought a little bit more about what we want, maybe we need to see another iteration before we really conclude the, the data we want to see. But um, I think this board has some work, too, to provide more direct and specific guidance. Um, so why don't we so, just do see the next iteration of the report in September? So at least we begin to format the report a bit better. I mean, quite frankly, I like seeing the small numbers. I'm actually going to point out that to me, this is a bit of what sometimes Nisha says, because there's a lot of small numbers here. And when people have the money available, they seem to be spending it. And then they seem to come in for fairly substantial increases when appropriate, too. But to me, that was one of the interesting things on this, how many of these are spent down to very, very um, almost insignificant numbers. And I would say it's probably at least a third of these. Um, and so for me, actually, looking at the small ones was, was as interesting as looking at the big ones. But there were a couple there that I really questioned. So I think seeing the data then makes me question, like, okay, if this is the data coming out of our um, open capital report, this is essentially what this is what's left over. Some of these were a little kind of makes me wonder about the other the quality of the other report a little bit. Maybe not. I didn't follow that. That's okay. <laughs> okay, so um thank you very much, Roland, and please thank Adam um for this one. And our next um item on our agenda is um review of ARP spending. And I think we have a report in here, Pete. I think you wanted, felt that it would be appropriate for us to talk about this in our July meeting. So we have um, a report grant summary here. Is, is there any special request, or you just want me to go through the whole report? No, I think, well, you had suggested that we look at this. I think the, the critical thing is, I mean, if I have a question, it is like, I can, are I people can give you spending a, appropriately? And is there any risk of any of these projects not being spent within the deadlines that we have? And, you know, beginning to have some red flag system so that if we okay. want to make changes. I could, I, I could spend about five minutes uh, and uh, satisfy that uh, question. Um, I'll start with page one. And um, I'll reference uh, in the upper left column, the first column, 105, and work down. Uh, the, the 105 section is 19 subrecipients. The subrecipients are, are the uh, uh, external entities that you normally see. You're familiar with almost all of them. All 19 of them were picked through an RFP process. All 19 of them have signed legal agreements saying that they will spend the money as uh, was requested. Can I just interrupt for a second, Leslie? Do you, I mean, I'm just questioning whether this is answering the question that you have, or should we just focus on risks that Pete sees in this report? He reports to the BET monthly on this. I don't want to waste his time repeating the same discussion unless you know of something that. What? Well, no. Pete said he could gotten. spend about five minutes on this. I think that just doing this is probably a good idea. Okay. It, it, I'll do less than five minutes. Uh, the subrecipients, uh, as you can see, if you look at the spending and the encumbrances, they're all zeros to the right, no risk. Uh, all of them the projects will be uh, expended. And, and you said they have signed an agreement. Is there any kind of audit that goes out to them? I mean, you know, we have these single audits, say, that we do and some of these other. Are there any audit requirements here by the government or anything that 
we will have to be responsible for? I was, I was actually going to mention that. Thank you. Uh, okay. The, um, the, so in the case of risk uh, in the 105s, uh, they're all either spent or obligated. Uh, to your question, which I was just about to bring up, is the 130, the finance, that's the audit fee. Uh, if you look at the column uh, prior year spending, uh, there's only two expenditures, one for the Hardin Road for $1,415, and then there's the uh, revenue uh, selection for GHS soil remediation for $6,871,000. Please stop me if, if, if you, you're not following where I am. Hey, so I'm not, I'm me, I'm not following where you are. I'm in the prior year column. spending column. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, okay. and, and it, it, goes, it goes to your question about the single audit. Uh, because we receive more than $750,000, we're subject to the single audit, which we do every year. The single audit has two pieces. There's the CESA and the CEFA. The S in the CESA is state, and the F in the CEFA is financial. So there's state and federal uh, reimbursements. So there's that line, which uh, the $20,000. Uh, their initial fee, uh, the initial uh, audit, uh, uh, centered on one project, the soil remediation. So they, uh, as far as the U.S. Treasury requirements and uh, single audit requirements, uh, they only looked at that project. For the year ending 23, they will start looking at, at every single one of these, okay? And in the case of the subrecipients, the 19, they look at... Uh, for example, I'll go back to the soil remediation. One of the qu series of questions they asked was, were these uh, projects bid out? Uh, were they, did they follow uh, purchasing policies and procedures, et cetera? So when we get back to the subrecipients, the 19, um, they'll ask, where, to my point about the RFPs, how did you find them? I'll, we'll explain through the audit process that we went through an, a request for a proposal. Uh, they'll say, do you have signed legal agreements, okay? We have 19 signed legal agreements where they're stating that they will legally spend the money the way they requested it. Obviously, there's a control feature that we don't have. If we give money to, and I won't name any of the, uh, the, the non-entities, there's, there's probably no way that we, that we could know that they honestly spent every single dollar of, say, $50,000. What we, in their cases, we would rely on their auditors to come up with a report. So as part of the audit requirement for the RSM, our auditors, we would seek uh, audits for these entities. However, there's a disconnect and it doesn't work that way because these expenditures, the year would end now and nonprofits are notorious for having delinquent audits. They go one, two, three years in arrears. So when they do their audit this fall, there's no way that they will have an audit that they could tie to these expenditures this fall. Do you follow what, the, what I'm saying as far as the, non, the nonprofits? So what happens is the final uh, comments on the audit for the single audit is they will go through each one of these in the current year spending section, and then they will, they will uh, I can't say they will look at every single one, but they, in the case of the non the the, the uh, whether it's human services or public works, they will make sure that we're following uh, policy purchasing policies and procedures. Was it bid out? Uh, were quotes uh, received, et cetera? To your risk question, um, I'll quickly. Uh, risk number one is 171 affordable housing trust fund. I probably don't need to uh, tell you about the risk involved because uh, it, I don't know at what point uh, we're going to meet the December 31st, 2024 uh, obligation uh, of, of those funds. And that, that's a topic for another day. So there's a risk there, okay? Uh, if we go to the 302s in the DPW engineering, uh, I would say there's minimal list, uh, risk there. You can see that each one of these, there is spending. Uh, the initial spending, these are small amounts. Uh, I happen to know this because I'm following the U.S. Treasury uh, report, the quarterly report. These are basically surveying costs, uh, which are startup costs before you get to the construction cost. No risk there. Uh, 315 uh, is, is the soil remediation. You can see if you look to the right, that project is just about closed. 
uh, and it was audited for the year ending 2022. 361, uh, this, Leslie, to your question, th this is high risk, okay? Uh, and when I say high risk, I can't tell you without going and drilling down into each one of these uh, to know exactly how high the risk is. Usually in this area, there's a, a, a permitting process that slows up projects, but as we go along, we have to pay more and more attention attention to these projects to make sure that they're done in a timely manner. Okay. Uh, the health administration. So, so can I just ask, so just to follow up, um, Pete, would you recommend, you know, let's let them go through the summer and into the fall, um, but that we pick in a month like November for them to come in just as an extra report here for, for them to come in and, and just update us on each of these projects to, to make sure there's no risk, or do you think that that the liaisons can handle this fine without it coming, or without I coming? Can't, I can't pick a specific month, but I, what I can, do, I, I monitor all of these projects. I, I, I look, I drill down every quarter. Right. Uh, that's how I knew, for example, that these are surveying costs. I have to input them into a, a, a computer database, and it goes off to the U.S. Treasury. Auditors come around and they audit them, but I can't pick. Uh, I would say don't wait till the budget process in in February. That's why I picked. So November, I would say but... October, November. Okay, but October, I November. do give a monthly report, and right. if, if I see something that's high risk uh, every month, I'll point it out, okay. and then you could feed off of that and say that we should bring them in next month. Okay, super. That uh, that sounds like a good plan. Four One Health Administration. That's Stephanie Palmino. We all know Stephanie. These, she's very health. Uh, uh, influential and educated in the, uh, the health care. She used to work for us for years, uh, and she, she does uh, reporting on COVID. Uh, no risk there. Uh, the uh, 501s are all human resources. They're, these are pass-throughs. Uh, they're all uh, basically up and running, um, as far with the exception of the bank, but I don't see any risk at the bank, uh, meaning the Byram Archibald uh, Center uh, in the 501 section. Uh, I don't see any risk there. The Board of Education, kudos to the Board of Education. Uh, you can see that five of them have already been uh, completely closed out, uh, and uh, I could see these all being uh, finished in a timely manner, and then the library's closed out. So basically, uh, I've, I, I would say the one area of, the two areas of high risk are the affordable housing trust fund which we would have to repurpose if it, if they never, if the request doesn't come through, and I would pay uh, closer attention to the engineering division at this point. Hopefully, I've answered your question. Yeah. Any questions? Questions? No. Thank you so much. Appreciate okay. your update. Okay. So now we have um, <coughs> some minutes on our meeting to to. Uh, Handle um, June 23rd special meeting minutes. Are there any motions? Um, can I ask the question? I know that um, I want to make sure that um, Ms. Erickson's satisfied with the, the recommended changes to the 23rd and the 6th. Yeah, the sheets that Shira handed out before the meeting um, are good with me. I, I don't know that the ones in the packet are the right ones, no, but the they, ones in front of us are, are, oh, I, are fine. No, th these were the updated with your comments. Yes, these ones. So these yeah, will be... So I had her bring down, print the ones with your final comments, with, or, or with the final comments that were made, and, and to bring down. So I'll make the motion, we'll do these separately, to approve the June 23rd special meeting minutes as revised. A second. Uh, so, Ms. Moriarty has made a motion, seconded by Ms. Aurora. Those in favor? Four zero zero. Okay. Uh, um, the next set of minutes we have are for the June 6, 2023 regular meeting. So, I'll make the motion to approve the June 6th meeting as re minutes as revised. Second. Those in favor? Four zero zero. 
Again, motion made by Ms. Moriarty, second by Ms. I, I'm sorry, I missed it. Uh, was the first set amended when you voted? They, they've been amended since they were posted, yes. Do you want amended in the... Uh, I don't think it's necessary. Everyone has the minutes if they want, if they want to say. No, I do. It's so we we have a process issue which I think we need to resolve. That so the agenda gets posted with the packet and it has information in it. Then, for example, with the minutes, they get revised. I believe Shira reposts the packets and the original packet disappears from the website and a new packet's up. So anybody that's looked at the packet before the revisions put up. There's no indication it's a revised packet. So I think we have a, a problem that information's out in the public, then something gets revised, and there's no indication that it's been revised. There's no separate document if it's revised. And so um, I don't know whether she's amended the packet. I know the question came up with the April minutes that we're going to talk about next. The, um, she... So I, think I mean, quite the, frankly, I think you're right. It, you know, and it's, it's, it's everywhere. It's, you know... That every when when packets are posted and additional things are received or whatever, it doesn't make any difference whether it's a budget committee or the BET or whatever, things get put into the packet or substituted or added. And, you know, I mean, it happens to all of us. If we have a packet that's printed out on Thursday, and the meeting is on Monday night or, you know, whatever it happens to be, you might not have everything there. So, you know, but I think that, you know, I, I don't know. It's, so it's, it's a problem I think, that's well beyond. I do think there's a better process, and that is that once the packet's put on the website, it shouldn't change. And if there's a revised packet, it should indicate packet revised. And if there's an additional document, it could be listed separately, new Board of Ed document or whatever going forward, and that's true for all of the committees and the full BETs you recommended. For this particular question, I think it should say as amended because we did change something in the minutes from what was originally posted. I don't know what's up there now. Or we could do exactly what the Board of Education does and wait until a minute before the meeting is to start and only post our packets then. I would not recommend that. <laughs> Okay, so my question is for the 23rd and the 6th. She wants it as amended. Yes. As yes, amended. they're both amended. Got it. Both, they, they both have changes. Long care. <laughs> so now Ask we get... Ask a simple question, Pete. <laughs> so so um, now we get to April 11th. So I'll make a motion to approve the April 11th minutes as um, as circulated this afternoon. So... Why don't we just say as amended, if you'd be willing to do that. Now, I did ask you if you, since the changes that you submitted now, and I went back and there's like about five different versions of these that I've seen back in April through something like April 19th. Um, so... I would like to to either do, I, I'm willing to approve these, okay, but I would like to either have you send a um, mark changes or have you, or I could do a document compare, but I just didn't have time when these came in to do a document compare. So what's interesting, this is my failure potentially at one, at the one share version. I believe I made these changes on a shared OneDrive document because I don't have this saved at all on my computer. And I couldn't find it in my OneDrive library, couldn't find it in the BET OneDrive library, might be in the Tarkington OneDrive library. So I think document compare is the only way to go. So, so, so um, the, the bottom line is, somehow I want to say that there's a possibility that you might have actually handwritten it. I don't know. But I didn't have the right pack. I need to, I have a different envelope for that. I have the April envelope with me, but I don't have the, it should be May, because that's where I would have put the minutes. I mean, the one, item number but one I'm, was totally rewritten, so there are a lot of changes, so track changes would have been complicated. I, I, I read but it, I and it, 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 I read it, and it sounded pretty good to me, to be very honest with you. So what I would be willing to do is to approve these minutes, and just, if you and I 
would let everyone know if there were any changes from what you proposed. But it looked pretty good to me, and everyone else can whatever. Now, this we, we will prove it, and then I'm going to make another comment after this. If, if I, are you I, willing I, to do that? I'm fine with that, and we can always reopen it at the next meeting if there's something that's I not I can't imagine properly. that we're going to need to reopen it. Yeah. But I am happy to approve this. If you want to say as amended, I will. I will. And someone seconds it. I will approve it, but I just like to see either a document compare or. And yeah. you're now saying you don't have it, so uh, so that's fine. I'll do a document compare. It's easy. So I will make the motion to approve April 11th budget committee meeting minutes as amended, and I will second. Those in favor of Leslie's motion, um, seconded by Laura. I like Laura. By by Ms. Aurora. Um, or by Nisha, I said Leslie and Nisha. Four zero zero. As amended. They're all as amended. Now, what I will say is that on these particular minutes, and I've already talked to Roland and I'm going to be sending an email, we have two conditions of release. And while we talk about our processes, I'm going to email that to Roland, or to Adam, copy Roland, and all of you to make sure that in Adam's file of conditions that we are really tracking all of our conditions, including those made on interim approvals. We tend to keep track of the conditions that we make annually in our budget, but not necessarily the interim. Can I ask a question, Roland? Is there a way in Munis for you to input, have, have a field that um, signals there's a condition on the funds? Because I think right now you're just doing this manually. Some, when that it, the appropriation shows as an ability to spend, and it's only your oversight or the de department's oversight that you know the conditions there. What we can do is say we approve $300,000 for project and capital. We can put it into the budget and then close it out. So it shows the original appropriation and the closeout, and there's no money to spend against it. I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. But then we're understating our open count. Yes, we are. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't like that method either, because the other issue is it's not just capital, it's operating. And I think, and now I have to go back, to April 11th was a long time ago, but as I remember, one of those conditions is on operating and the other was on capital. That's why we ended up having two. Because I actually asked Leslie, this is the same condition on both of these. And then I remembered, oh, maybe one was operating, one was capital. So anyway, I think it's something to think about as we, you know, look at our processes. I agree with you. I mean be nice. I mean, only if there's a red flag field that your department then knows to check before they approve invoices. But um, sounds like that may not be a viable mechanism either. Um, I think the I'd, I'd be a little concerned with zeroing out a project because that could be confusing to a department looking at it to see what money is available, et cetera. So, but it's certainly something to think about the best way to. Especially if we were planning to bond the project. I'm not sure that makes a difference. I don't know. Sounds pretty complicated to me. I, we, I think we need to come up with a better system. But I bring this up because these particular minutes, the April 11th, have two conditions on them. We just need to make sure we're tracking them. Can I make a motion to adjourn? So let's just make a motion. 239. I'll second. And um, those in favor? OK. Thank you all. We've lost all of our guests. 400, and we adjourn at 239.